This is the Tuscan Reader Podcast, Episode 8. I'm your host, Matthew. In this episode, Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy Lesser Evil Review, as well as my thoughts on Star Wars The Phantom Menace novelization, along with some other publishing news. Goodreads. It's a popular website where people go and review books. Anybody can do it. You just create an account, go review your book. Pretty nice. So they're doing this Goodreads Choice Awards for the year of 2021, and a Star Wars book has been nominated in the science fiction category, and it's uh, The High Republic Light of the Jedi, written by Charles Soule. So if you want to go vote, you can go vote for it to win this uh, Goodreads Choice Awards. Uh, The opening round has started. It's actually coming to a close. Um, It started November 16th and is ending on November 28th, and the final round of voting will be November 30th through December 5th, and the winner will be announced on December 9th. So, if you have a Goodreads account, go over there and vote for what books you think should win the uh, Goodreads Choice Awards. You know, there's multiple categories. The only Star Wars book there is uh, Light of the Jedi in the science fiction category. I like Goodreads. It's a pretty cool thing where people go and express their thoughts if they don't want to get on YouTube and talk about books. They could do it over on Goodreads. So that's pretty cool. It's a good way to get started off if you wanted to really get to reviewing books on the internet. Get your Find your review voice. I recommend uh, you do so. If you read a book, why not share your thoughts with other people around the world? In Star Wars news, Dark Horse Comics is going to be returning to Star Wars. It was announced on November 18th that they're going to be printing stories throughout every era from the High Republic all the way up to the rise of the First Order. I mean, they wrote comics for Star Wars back in the 90s, the early 2000s, and then when Lucasfilm was purchased by Disney, comic book rights went over to Marvel. The article isn't clear on whether or not it's replacing the IDW comic book series, which is the Young Reader comics or the Adventure series. It, it doesn't say anything specifically about that, but what I guess what is leading people to believe that it is taking over the IDW stuff is one of the last uh, sentences here in the article says, Marvel Comics will continue publishing its line of critically acclaimed Star Wars comics alongside Dark Horse Comics. No mention of IDW. So I'm wondering if maybe their contract has expired and uh, Star Wars is going to move into a new direction with Dark Horse. Who knows? Maybe the Marvel line will come to an end pretty soon and they'll make an entire shift over to Dark Horse. I know a lot of fans of Star Wars comics really did appreciate what Dark Horse had done back in the 90s and the early 2000s before the Disney takeover. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I have no interest in returning to comic book reading, even with Dark Horse taking over. I just don't really have the time or the care to read the comic books. But this could be a good thing. I mean, I don't hear anybody talking about IDW's adventure series. So this could be a, a nice, fresh start for comic book stuff. I don't know if it's going to be young reader things or if it's just a whole nother line of comics that they're going to do. It's going to be interesting to see... And uh, when the news comes out closer to that release date, what's actually going to happen? So alongside that comic book news on November 18th, Del Rey Star Wars on their Twitter account released the cover image for Star Wars Brotherhood. It's going to be a new novel releasing May 10th, 2022, written by Mike Chin. So the art, not that great, to be honest with you. In my opinion, art is definitely, you know, personal preference. I mean, most of the cover looks great. That you get this nice cream color that covers the whole book, and then there's this circular image behind two characters on the front. You got Obi Wan and Anakin. They cheapen up the cover quite a bit, but the background you got this mountainous region with this palace that's lit up. You see clouds. You see what might be either the sky or the ocean. I can't really tell. It's kind of hard to tell when you're looking at a picture on the internet. But when the book's in your hand, whole different story. Um, but yeah, these pictures of Obi Wan and Anakin. They really cheapen up the cover quite a bit. I mean, they look like they're just cut and pasted from, you know, stills that were made for the movie, like promotion art. But they both have their lightsabers extended. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi is in the front, kind of crouched down. And behind him is Anakin, who looks like he's bigger than Obi-Wan Kenobi, which is weird. Not just because he's, like, lifted up taller, but, like, all of his features are bigger than Kenobi, who is in front of him. That looks weird. And Anakin's got his hands kind of twisted down with his lightsaber extended as well and Anakin looks like a redhead in his facial feature he's got a lot of freckles on his face he looks more like the character from that Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order video game Cal Kestis that's who he looks like on this cover um wow 
that's that he really looks like Cal Kestis there. That's so strange. But I'm interested to see what this book is going to be like. I mean, it'd be fun to have a new Obi-Wan and Anakin adventure. Uh, and the StarWars.com has on their website, uh, what exactly was all that business on Cato Nemoidia? We'll find out soon. Okay, so see, it was like, the question was, what is that palace? StarWars.com tells you, Cato Nemoidia. Maybe. I mean, of course, that could be a different location, but I'm going to assume now... That's what it is. The artist responsible for this cover is Laura Rosero. Uh, like I said, I like most of it, but just the two characters on the front really just look like a cut and paste from promotional material that I don't really like. Uh, Brotherhood picks up after the events of Star Wars Attack of the Clones. With the Clone Wars raging across the galaxy and Anakin and Padme Amidala secretly married, following an explosion that devastates Cato Nemoidia, the jewel of the Trade Federation, blame falls on the Republic. The Jedi Council sends Obi-Wan to the planet, and in his investigation, he comes to sense the presence of the dark side warrior Asajj Ventress. Meanwhile, Anakin Skywalker, newly risen to the rank of Jedi Knight, again disobeys a command and comes to the aid of his friend and former master. The website goes into a little bit about the opening of the book, and it's Obi-Wan and Anakin being promoted to their next ranking in the Jedi Order. Uh, they don't even have time to question why they're doing the things that they're doing or who the clones are. So it's going to be an interesting book. I'm not going to read all of the details about what the book is about because I like to leave that bit a mystery. All right, so before we get into the review of Star Wars Thrawn Ascendancy Lesser Evil and the Phantom Menace novelization, I wanted to mention something about that one novel, Ronin. Remember that one, the canon slash non-canon book? So the book did receive some okay ratings. It got uh, a lot of people saying that they were confused about stuff. And, you know, I reviewed this book. I got confused when it came to certain things with, the char with a character. And I heard other people review this book, and they had the same problem that I did. And there is this character that uh, I don't know what it is, you know, is they use the pronoun of they, them. And that confused a lot of people, especially when there came to be a group conversation. And the author took to Twitter. I hate it when authors take to Twitter to express themselves when it comes to their own work. I think it's kind of childish. But here's the thing. This Emma Candon, she went to Twitter and said, Things I like. Ignoring bad opinions and writing more trans people into literally everything. She goes on to say, other things I like, ignoring soak med, which I kind of figured that's probably meaning social media. So other things I like, ignoring social media to the point that I need my wife to explain the bad opinion of the day so I can laugh about it as we eat lunch. More things I like that I don't have to give aforementioned bad opinions my time or attention because all that time and attention is being taken up with, again, writing more trans people in literally everything tee hee that is exactly what you shouldn't be doing people got confused and they didn't like being confused so you like to twist things and say that uh everybody is oh they're bad opinions they're bad opinions no they're actually good opinions and they're um you need to take that into account when you write characters you should make things that are clear and concise you don't want to confuse people when there's a group of people talking and one individual is referring to themselves in a plural, so confusing. People don't like that. Authors, if you want to you want to write books with these types of characters in it, okay, whatever. But figure out a way to make it uh, understandable to all the regular people, because we don't we don't understand it. We have to keep going back and rereading. Wait, what in? Okay, who is talking? Who's feeling something? Because when it's a, uh, they are doing this in the group, who are they? These are more multiples, or is it just a one? What What's happening? Because I've never, ever in my entire life ever heard somebody want to be referred to in the plural until 2020. It's confusing, it's weird, and I think uh, you guys got to figure out how to write stuff not confusing. You know, this is probably going to shut you off from the Tuscan Reader, but I don't care. I mean, it's just, I just want to read a good book that I understand what's happening, and I know that other people want the exact same thing. So let's figure that out, guys. Um, yeah, people are probably going to shut off their podcast now, not happy with that. But you know what? I don't care. I just speak the truth. That's what I'm doing. So let's move on to some reviews. Star Wars The Phantom Menace novelization was written by New York Times best-selling author Terry Brooks. So this tale takes place 32 years before the events of A New Hope, and you've probably seen this film many, many times, but 
to give you a brief overview, we've got the Galactic Trade Federation overstepping its bounds and releasing a droid army against Naboo after a trade dispute. Now the Jedi step in to bring peace to the whole situation, but they find themselves uh, unable to do so. They then have to protect Queen Amidala, which is the Queen of Naboo. They have to leave Naboo, they get into a space battle, get some damage to their ship. Then they find themselves stranded on the planet Tatooine, which is out far in the Outer Rim. Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn heads into the city to find parts for their broken down ship. While he's there, he runs into a boy, Anakin, who is force sensitive. Now Qui-Gon thinks that this kid might be something great someday. He's thinking that this kid might have been spoken of in Jedi prophecy. The one individual that will bring balance to the Force. This novelization was fine. A lot of it reflected the film almost beat for beat. We did have a few additions to the story, such as a pod race with Anakin in the beginning. Uh, that was actually pretty cool. Um, there was some other goofy things that did happen, like uh, Anakin had this run-in with sand people, or to be more politically correct, uh, Tuscan people. What really surprised me is we do have mention of Darth Bane in this book. Which, that's really cool. Now, I did not expect that to happen, but it does mention that Darth Bane had a male apprentice. Well, I read the Darth Bane trilogy. The reviews could be found here on the Tuscan Reader. Uh, Darth Bane did not have a male apprentice. It was a female, and her name was Darth Xana. But of course, the novelization gets a pass because this was written before the Bane trilogy. I found it interesting and kind of funny that Qui-Gon sold Anakin's pod racer after Anakin's victory to Anakin's rival, Saboba. Because, you know, Saboba's pod racer was damaged in that, uh, that race, so I thought it was kind of funny. There really isn't much else to say about the book or the plot. I mean, let's get real. If you're watching this novelization review of Star Wars The Phantom Menace, you've probably seen it, you know, several times. Darth Maul does speak a little bit more in this novelization. He has a verbal exchange with the Trade Federation folks. That was neat. Um, the final thing that I'll mention in this novelization review is that uh, Qui-Gon Jinn, at his funeral, this is bizarre, they released doves. I, I just, I found that really goofy. I mean, it's Star Wars, and they're releasing doves at a funeral. Whatever. If you have not yet read the Phantom Menace novelization, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think you need to. I mean, I told you a lot of the differences right here. Nothing too special. It was a fine read, though. I mean, it's the Phantom Menace. It was one of those movies that everybody had to bash because they said it was so boring. I enjoyed it, but I don't think this is essential reading. But if you want to, go for it. I give this one a B. All right, so let's go ahead and move into Thrawn Lesser Evil, the conclusion of the Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy. Thrawn Ascendancy Lesser Evil is book three in the Ascendancy trilogy. It was written by best-selling author and the author that helped kick off the Star Wars expanded universe, Timothy Zahn. So this trilogy takes place after the events of Attack of the Clones. So the Chiss Ascendancy is threatened by this alien race that's completely unknown to their people. Now, the Ascendancy pays little attention to the one that brought light to this threat, Thrawn. The enemy, Jixus, is a warrior and leader of the Grisk species. He's concocted this plan to turn the Chiss against themselves, fracturing what little trust the ruling families have in each other. Now, Thrawn is fully aware of the theatrics created by the Grisks and acts alone to defend the Ascendancy, no matter what the outcome is and no matter the cost. Thrawn and Jixus finally face off in this action-packed political tale. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you weren't a fan of the memory chapters in the previous books, like myself, then you're going to feel the same way with this book. These memory chapters make the story way too predictable and, at times, uh, a little silly. They really add nothing to the story other than the predictability, but one memory chapter in this book was pretty fine. However, there is one that really confused me, and I did not like that because I had to go back through the book and see if I missed something. I didn't. When it comes to the characters, we've got the Magus, which is a leader of the refugee party that we met in book two. Turns out she's force sensitive, but she doesn't call it the force. They call it the beyond. Her species calls it the beyond. Uh, she has this brief connection with the Chiss Skywalker Sheree, which is a little neat. Thrawn is actually taken aback a little bit when he discovers that the Magus can see into the future. And of course, this is probably just some foreshadowing as Thrawn will be thrust into the galaxy where the Galactic Empire rules, which is, you know the other canon trilogy for Thrawn, where he's going to have interaction with Darth Vader, so he's already been exposed to the Force. Thrawn always knows what lies around the bend. He's ten steps ahead of everybody, like, all the time. Um, 
sometimes that comes across cheap. Sometimes it works for, you know, the plot. But, you know, it it's just an easy write-off from danger, and it always makes Thrawn the hero. So, kind of like the author's pet. Jixus, who was mysterious in the previous books, remains so in this book as well. He likes to stay to the shadows, keeps a veil over his face. He's very manipulative. He is determined to wipe out the Chiss ascendancy. He pits the Chiss against each other, starting with the smaller, weaker families first. He spins up these tales of betrayal, and, uh, you know, that causes a lot of drama within the Chiss. I had assumed that Jixus was going to be this ultra-powerful, very unique, interesting character, but uh, sadly for me, it just... He just fell flat and became very underwhelming for me. The dialogue was great, consistent with the previous books, which is nice, nothing to complain about there. Um, there is one character that I noticed got picked on a lot from both the protagonist side and the antagonist side, because he would weave between the, the two of them. Um, each person that would get irritated with him, they would use his title, like full title, kind of like when a parent gets onto a child, they use their first, middle, and last name. I found that kind of humorous. Um, but I'm actually kind of surprised that this uh, wasn't turned into a five, six, seven, or even ten book series. There's so much going on in these stories that, uh, like with the politics, the military stuff, the alien things, and of course, you know, all the stuff going on from the villain's point of view, it could have easily been turned into a much larger series. Lesser Evil is the biggest book in Star Wars canon so far. It's over 500 pages, and I think if it was turned into a bigger series, it wouldn't have felt rushed, because this book, yes, it does feel a little rushed. Some things had to be wrapped up really fast, which, you know, ultimately they weren't really wrapped up completely like I would hope they would have been, but um, if this was a longer series, I would have been much happier. Overall, I, I enjoyed the book. I, I give this book a B. So that does it for this episode of The Tuscan Reader. Remember, I'm on YouTube. Check it out. You can find uh, video content there or just keep listening here on the podcast. So guys, take care. Mm -hmm.